you're on time, the best seats in the house, right? Mm -hmm. My name is Ingrid Nuttall, um, and I am the WIT Events Committee co-chair, and I am so excited to be with you today. I work in the Office of Information Technology and Infrastructure, and I just want to give you a little bit of context of this event and why we decided to put it together today. So many of you have probably participated in some of our more either informal or shorter networking events, either coffee or part of the Right Speak Lead series that we've had. And in addition to that, the WIT Events Committee puts on two major events each year, one in the fall and one in the spring. So this is our major event for the fall, and we decided to approach this year with a little bit more of a theme in mind. So we decided to look broadly at the history of women in IT at the University of Minnesota. So this event in the fall is going to be focused more on the broader historical context of women's contributions to IT both outside the university walls and within the university walls. So that's part of our um, approach to the panel today. And in addition to that, we have some physical displays that we've been working on that outline the history of women IT, again, both outside and inside the university walls. Those panels we had intended to have on display for you in the Upson room today, but we're not quite done. That's okay. We have both some hard copy handouts that you can pick up on your way out, and then when we adjourn to the Upson room for the networking event after the presentation, we will have the panels projected there as well. When they are complete, they will be available for viewing up on the second floor in Walter Library. And then in the spring, we'll be adding some additional panels that will be focusing on other aspects of the history of women in IT at the University of Minnesota. So that's a little bit about why you're here today. Um, we're making history right now, <laughs> right? You're living it. I'm going to do a few housekeeping items, which are super important. So everybody listen up. Please mute your phones. Um, I work in operations, so I know that sometimes it just needs to be on buzz, but if you could please do that for the courtesy of everyone around you, that would be great. As I mentioned, we will be adjoining to the Upson room later for refreshments. We really hope that you can make it. Um, it would be a great opportunity for you to network with each other and reflect on what you've heard here today. Uh, during the panel discussion, we'll have some of our WIT committee members. So we have Susan and Lisa, who Will, who have note cards that either you might have grabbed on your way in, or they can hand them to you now. And if you have questions as the panel is um, talking that are kind of coming up that you want to be asking in the moment, please write them down and they can grab them from you and then they'll pass them up to me and I'll kind of work it in through the conversation. At the very end of our pre-packaged panel discussion, we will open the floor up for conversation as well. But that will allow us to make sure that we get to people's questions and kind of keep things moving. Uh, finally, a couple of months ago, I sent out a link to a Google form to capture stories of your own experiences as a woman in IT at the University of Minnesota, and we got some responses. Um, we're going to share a link at the end of the presentation. We still want to capture those stories because that's going to be an important part of putting together both our event in the spring and the panels that we're still working on for that display. Um, we have been working on, we've been doing research with the university archives to create those panels, and it has been a challenging history to try and create. So we're really asking you to help contribute to building out that archive, not just for everyone here today, but for people coming after us who are asking these same questions to be able to look back and say, what were women in IT doing at the University of Minnesota during the... 2008, the year 2018, or before, because even though we're trying, you know, we're we're reflecting on things here, people have had sort of circuitous journeys. Some of us, and we want to capture those too. Um, we do have online attendees, so microphones are important. If you have questions at the end, I'm going to have to repeat them out because we don't have a microphone to run around for you. So those, I think, are the housekeeping items. Is there anything else I missed? I have a special shout out that I definitely want to do. Um, the work in putting this event together was done by the WITS events committees, but also the rest of the committees for the Women in Technology group, so big shout out to them. I want to thank um, KT Craig and Chris Goodlin and Russ uh, Koss for their work to put together the panels and do all that research. It's been a Sisyphean feat, but really impressive. All right, let's get to it. So I will introduce our panel. 
First I will awkwardly move to the arrow to move things along on the PowerPoint, sorry. So we have with us today uh, Professor Sally Gregory Colstead. Professor Colstead teaches in the History of Science and Technology program in the College of Science and Engineering. Her bachelor's degree is from Valparaiso University and her PhD is from the University of Illinois. With a fresh degree in the academic activist decade of the 1970s, she taught some of the first women's history courses in the country and went on to chair women's committees in major professional associations, direct women's studies programs on several campuses, including the Institute for Advanced Studies here at the University of Minnesota, and published books and articles relating to the history of women in science and technology. The overall focus of her research is on the dynamics of science and society, particularly in museums and education. She has recently been named the History of Science Society's the History of Science Society's certain medalist for 2018, the highest award in her profession. We also have with us Professor Maria Gini. Professor Gini is a CSE distinguished professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the university. Her research focuses on artificial intelligence and robotics, ranging from algorithms for exploration and for allocation of tasks to robots, to teamwork for search and rescue operations, and novel forms of human-robot interactions. She is an IEEE Fellow and a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. She is the winner of numerous awards, including the NC Witt Herald and Notkin Award for Research and Graduate Mentoring, the AAAI Distinguished Service Award, and many awards from the University of Minnesota. She has served on the Committee on the Status of Women in Computing Research Board since 2007, supporting a variety of activities for women in computer science at all career stages. We also have with us Samin Hickman. Samin retired from the University of Minnesota after working 32 years in the Office of Information Technology. Prior to working at the university, she worked for five years in the Defense Systems Division of Sperry Uni er, yes, Defense Systems Division of Sperry Univac training and supporting onboard computers for the U.S. Navy. During her time at the university, she began as an analyst programmer on mainframe computers and was later involved in the advancement, development, and distribution of computers and the supporting infrastructure on the university campus. As director of information technology, she oversaw the advancement and access to many areas of technologies on campus for students, staff, and faculty. Although her education was in music, um, from Tehran University, the University of Amsterdam, and the University of Minnesota. Her work concentration was entirely involved in technology and experiencing the greatest period of technological advancements. And finally, with us today, we have Kate Connors. She is the Director of Academic and Information Technology at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the university. She has over three decades of experience in video, digital media, and academic technology production. After serving 11 years as a news director at NBC, Kate began working in the field of education. Her experience as a documentary filmmaker provided her the foundation of investigation and concept visualization. Serving both in public education and higher education for the last 20 years, developing and creating educational materials, her MAED research was focused on virtual learning environments and the design of immersive educational experiences. She founded her own production company in 1995 and created educational content for many academic institutions. She went on to become the Instructional Technology Coordinator and Adjunct Professor in Academic Technology at Hamlin in St. Paul. She has created international education experiences with colleagues in Africa, Germany, the Middle East, Hong Kong, and most recently was invited to Nairobi, Kenya, and Dar es Salaam to train academic technologists from across the African continent. Please welcome our panel. So as I mentioned, in preparation for this event, we've been very interested in the evolution of technology roles for women um, and of the women individually in those roles. We had a lot of people who came to this field by accident or on a seemingly non-logical route. Um, many of us would admit to that ourselves. Uh, while others were drawn to the work very early in their career with intention. So we would like each of you to take a few minutes to speak to your own history a bit more. You each bring a different perspective to how women's roles and experiences have evolved in STEM and IT. So 
please tell the group a little bit more about yourself, your history, and notable observations that can help ground our conversation today. Samin, can you start? Okay. Um, so as, uh, as Ingrid said, I was born in Iran, and I uh, grew up in Tehran. Uh, uh, attended the high school and university in Tehran. I, I graduated from Tehran University in um, musicology. But my background was um, growing up in a, in a home where my parents insisted on education. And even though in Iran it was very common for women by 15, 16 to be married off, my parents insisted on education. So there was my very first advantage um, uh, over other girls my age uh, at, in, in Tehran. Um, when I finished University of Tehran, I was given a full scholarship to attend University of Amsterdam and study ethnomusicology, which is study of ethnic music. And um, even though my degree was in musicology, they switched me over to ethnomusicology because that's what their expertise was. And I spent uh, two years studying Indonesian music and dance. I played the gamelan and danced uh, with two different groups, Balinese and, and Javanese dances. So as you can see, my background has nothing to do with technology and everything is accidental. Um, and then I came back here and went to University of Minnesota. So my experience is is wonderful because I have experienced so many different things before I came to technology and it was all by accident. Um, I was hired uh, by Berlitz School of Languages to teach Farsi to a group of military people who were coming to be trained um, in programming uh, on uh, UNIVAC systems. And UNIVAC at the time had uh, two different mainframes that were installed on submarines and ships, Yuk-7 and Yuk-20. And they hired me to teach the, the Iranian group that was coming here to uh, teach them um, about the environment and, and also teach the Americans to speak Farsi to them. And of course, that was just before the revolution in Iran. And when the revolution happened, everything fell apart. And there was no need for me. But they decided to keep me. They said, we'll train you to teach programming. And that's how I started with technology. <laughs> that's the story of technology in my life. And, and they trained me to teach, um, to uh, program the computers on board ships. Uh, wasn't quite my uh, cup of soup, but I, I decided I'm going to do it. And uh, I was there for five years. It was a complicated environment, working in a military environment with mostly retired military people who were hired by UNIVAC. And of course, the people who worked there were all uh, involved in uh, computers that were uh, related to military activities. Uh, but it was a wonderful experience. And, and then, of course, I came to the university because I decided I, I was more an academic person as opposed to a military person. So, uh, And I started here as a computer programmer, an analyst programmer, and then gradually moved into other areas. And of course, I, as I said uh, in the introduction, um, the period I was at the university was probably the most exciting time for technology. Because when I came here, there was only a CDC computer and a VAX computer. And that was what we used for teaching. I used teletypes to program um, and look at where we are today. And I was involved with 30 years of change on, on this campus. And it was absolutely the most exciting time of my life. I loved what I did as a, as a student and what I studied. But uh, as you know, music and technology are a good combination and it worked really well for me. I'm really glad I had a chance to do what I did. That's really a wonderful story. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for being here. Um, it's uh, just wonderful. I had said this earlier to Ingrid that it's just wonderful to see so many, hi Peg, see so many women here. Um, I guess I didn't know that there was this many women in technology. I was just, um, so uh, I started out my career, you had said something about circuitous journeys. Well, I'll tell you what mine was. Um, I started out as a, a, 
in television as an NBC News director, fresh out of school with a brand new degree in radio, TV, and film. And I um, uh, became the, a news director in a union station with uh, 100 male colleagues. Um, and union meant that they had been there many years. So not only was I one of the youngest, but I was the only woman. And um, I had to very quickly learn how to navigate um, this new scenario without any experience. And um, it was really quite a journey. And over the, the course of this time, I'll be able to uh, tell you more about that. But um, uh, after about 11 years, I decided that I needed to leave television. And um, I had all this experience in uh, digital uh, video production. And so I thought, well, what else can I do? And it's like, oh, I'll go into education. They're just starting to create uh, digital educational content. So, um, and I canoe and kayak and I wanted to get closer to Canada. So I moved. <laughs> I moved up here and um, was able, I had a job offer at one of the TV stations here, but I really had decided that I was done with that. So um, I uh, landed a job at um, Osseo School District for a couple of years and uh, learned about um, what they were doing uh, around education and started developing things. And it was from there that, um, because of my experience, I was able to um, start a business. And I then the business grew and I was making educational documentaries for the federal government and different agencies. And, um, and I did that for 15 years and decided that um, I needed, um, and there's a whole not, there's a whole bunch of other events that, but we're just going to skip those little milestones. And I ended up uh, going back to school and getting a degree um, in education, and um, ended up at the Humphrey School. And I'll have more to tell later, but it's just really wonderful to be here. Thank you. Well, I don't have a story that's anything like these two stories because I'm here as a kind of imposter. I'm really a historian of science, as Ingrid pointed out. And so what I decided to do uh, is to say a little bit more about uh, three things. First, I want to say something about what is kind of my personal incentive to study the history of science, women in science and technology. Uh, secondly, I want to give you some data. I'm an academic, so I was really curious. She said, the last 40 years, what's been happening at the university? So I looked for a little bit of data that I can give you today, and then talk a bit more about the issues that I think women are addressing today that are going to be important for our ongoing discussion. So I came of age, as Ingrid said, in the late 60s and early 1970s, and I was particularly interested in feminism. Uh, I was also very interested in science and technology and always had been. In fact, one of the interesting stories is that when I was in high school, uh, I took an aptitude test and I scored the highest in mechanical. And my counselor, grade counselor, said to me, oh, that's very interesting, he said, but you'll make a wonderful teacher. And so I, re <laughs> so I really didn't contemplate how to use that, but I think I always had that interest in science and technology. So when I got to be an historian, I decided to look at the history of science and technology. So over the last few years, I have, in fact, spent a lot of time studying the history of women in science and technology. And I thought I would also, since you're all in, in, in IT and interested in computers, I actually brought in three books. I'm an academic, what can I say? Uh, so I thought there were three books that some of you might be interested in, if you're interested in the history of women in technology. One is a book by a woman named Ruth Odenzel, and she has a book called Making Technology Masculine. And it's called Women, Men, and Modern Machines in America. And what she really does is document the fact that there was something going on that women who were interested in technology in the early 20th century got pushed out of technology and didn't come back again until the late 20th century. And so how did that happen? And she has a really interesting book that talks about that. Because, you know, wherever we are today, we have to worry. Because early women were in technology. They got pushed out. We don't want that ever to happen again. So history sometimes has something to teach us. Another book that I think is really very interesting is called Gender and Technology. It's a reader and in this book what you really discover is how many women there have been in technology. From the Middle Ages on, women have been brewers and all kinds of things that really meant they were understanding technology, doing technology. It's not just the few women that we sometimes talk about who did some work in IT, but women actually got about a third of the patents in the late 19th century. Did you know that? 
Uh, so there have been times when women have really been active in technology, and this book helps us find those women, which is, I think, part of what uh, you're doing for this, this review. And the third book I want to point, point out is one that was done through our Babbage Institute for the History of Computing. I don't know how many of you know that we have one of the major centers for the history of computing on this campus in Anderson Library. And my colleague, Tom Misa, had a conference several years ago, and they brought in women to talk about women in computing. And the subtitle of his book, which is titled Gender Codes, is why women are leaving computing. And, and that's been kind of an ongoing question for us to think about because, again, there was a movement to bring women into computing, as you probably know, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. So I wanted you to know about the books because I'm an academic and I have them up here if you want to look at them later. But Ingrid's assignment was for us to think about recent history and perhaps more locally. So I did a bit of investigating. I came to the University of Minnesota in 1989. I arrived as an associate dean. My mandate was to do something by and for women uh, in the Institute of Technology. Maria Gini was already here, so she can attest to the fact that this is, this is what I came to do. Um, I very quickly learned that having that kind of brief didn't give me any traction at all, and so I managed to persuade the dean to make me the dean for academic affairs, which meant I could oversee things like hiring. Uh, and that became a really critical issue in the, in the subsequent years that I was here. Uh, but as some of you may know, in computing, the idea was that we were going to recruit more women into the Institute of Technology. We were going to have more retention programs for the women in the Institute of Technology. The initial idea was to think about faculty, but we very quickly began to think about the pipeline, work on women in graduate studies, graduate programs, as well as in, as well as in undergraduate. So I, so I wanted to look at the data about what has happened since I came in 1989. I was surprised, actually, for one thing. I wanted to find out how many women are in the infrastructure of IT. Many of you are in the infrastructure. And you know, that data isn't easy to find, because a lot of women are doing IT, but they're not seeing that in their job description, whether they're in libraries, whether they're in laboratories, or somewhere else. And so I think it's really important for this group to be thinking about how do you identify those women so that we know who you are, who they are. I do want to say that Joyce, Joy Wise Davis, who's the Director of Human Resources here in CSE, reported that 10 of 69 IT staff in CSE are women today, and that's 14%. It's a pretty low percentage, uh, but it's more than there were probably when I came, so this is, this is an important piece of data. More easily acquired data on campus relates to the fam familiar categories of faculty, grad students, and undergrads. So in CSE, the College of Science and Engineering, which is my home base, when I came, there were just 19 women. 5% uh, of the faculty <laughs> were women when I came in 1989. Today, there are 67 women. It's 16% of a faculty of 428 people. So there have been some gains. We can talk about how do you ha glass half empty, half full, or maybe even less than that half full. <laughs> uh, in computer science, there was just one woman, Maria Gini, and there was no one in electrical engineering. So if we think about women in computing or in the areas close to computing, we just didn't have the leadership there at that point in time. In 1990, all over in CSE, there were about 12% of the women were graduate students, uh, and now there are 26% of CSE are grad students. At the undergraduate level, there were about 15% in 1990. That had grown to 25% in 2008, and now it's 32%. So it's that pipeline that we have to be always thinking about, and there's clearly been some gain. And as I said, I think maybe your group will want to investigate where are those women who are in the infrastructure. Historians of science have gotten very interested in that question. Uh, much of the history of science used to be about Newton and Kepler and Darwin and the sort of famous men, but what we're discovering is how much science is really done collectively and collaboratively. We're really understanding that there's a lot of what historians and sociologists call invisible labor. And I know none of you want to think you're invisible, but maybe some days you do feel like you're invisible, and I think that's really the important group that we need to understand because the reason science and technology have advanced in this country is because we have that infrastructure, that educated infrastructure to make that possible. And I think we have to recognize that, talk about it, and understand how important women have been in that infrastructure as well. So the data I described are encouraging, but not where we want to be. So I want to say, make one last point, and that is I want to look at what's been going on uh, in the more recent past. I don't know how many of you, how many of you know that the National Academy of Sciences did a report last summer? Anybody here know? I see two hands go up. Um, 
we haven't had much leadership at the top about women in science and technology. The National Academy of Sciences has intermittently done occasional reports, but not very significant reports. And three years ago, they decided to do research and to really understand more about what's happening with women, gender, and science, because they thought the data that I just showed you, which is like the national data, doesn't reflect very much advance over the last 30 years. And so what's not happening? What's going wrong? And so they did a major report. They released it in July. Not a good time to release a report, I think. But they released a report on sexual harassment. And interestingly enough, the old idea of what is sexual harassment was in there. That is the idea that there's sexual innuendo, there's touching, there's feeling, maybe there's even coercion, is still around. But it has gone further underground than probably it was 30 years ago. But in trying to answer the question of why haven't we made more progress, what they understood is there's something they're now calling gender harassment. And that is, it's, it's whether you are female or perhaps bisexual or perhaps something else that has really kind of put you on the outside rather than the inside of the cultural group that you're part of. And so what they really wanted to do is understand how much that is also affecting the fact that women are either leaving, as Tom Mesa suggested, or not even going into the science areas where the culture doesn't seem that responsible. It's a superb report, uh, and it talks about a lot of things, including things like bystander action, which is what we know uh, will make a difference. That is, if you see something, say something uh, kind of behavior. But I think that this report tells me that we're moving into another phase. I really like the 21st century. We're moving into a phase where we're getting at some of the subtleties. We're not just talking about the overt, obvious behaviors, but we're really talking about how do we change a culture. So. My own story was not in science and technology, but boy, I found it fascinating to figure out what's been going on over the last 50 years. Maria. Okay. So uh, I joined the university in 1982 as an assistant professor in computer science. Uh, if I think back, there were 14 faculty, of course, all men. Then again, think back, all this staff, the secretarial accountant, uh, manager, were all women. They're all sharing a big room. All the computer staff, because we had a VAX, a VAX at the time, it was a good department, uh, were all men, of course, right? At the time, I didn't really think much about it. And I'm kind of saying, why was I so blind? And, and I think there are a number of reasons. And I'll just try to, to mention a few. First, I am optimistic by nature. I never think that somebody intentionally does something bad. So, you know, there are a lot of men. Sure, I mean, it yeah, happened, right? It's not that intentionally didn't want to hire women, right? So you kind of see the distinction there. Um, and being kind of naive means that it took me a long time before I figured out there is a women problem in the U.S., which is worse than the women problem in Italy. I mean, I knew there was some problem in Italy. I knew if you are in engineering, they're all boys uh, and all the stuff. If you are in physics, mathematics, chemistry, there are lots of women. Biology, only women. Men don't even touch there. So I mean, you know those kind of things. That's OK. I mean, you, you think that's, that's the way things are, right? I never really thought there was intentional drivers to drive those things. Uh, and, and one thing that I think also affected a lot the way I do things, I'm, again, reflecting back my education. I am from Italy. I studied, you know, went all university, everything in Italy. So elementary school, all the schools used to be multi-sex, but each class was only single sex. So we had the girls' class and the boys' class. This for five years, elementary school. Same thing in junior high, three years, boys and girls. I, of course, I was always with the girls, right? So I never saw a boy. I had no idea how they were behaving in class, because <laughs> I never was in a class, right? You see them outside, and you just oh, what I do? They kind of look weird. I don't care, right? Because we're always with girls. So then I went to, to high school, uh, and there was uh, almost the same thing. There they were mixed, uh, because in high school they were grown up, so you can get to the other sex. Uh, but for some reason, the class in which I was was mostly girls, very few men, maybe a third or less than a third, and it happened all the good, the top students were all the girls. The few boys were kind of not the good ones, right? And so 
I, I think you know this. Uh, this is to me is kind of interesting how how we grow up kind of affects our ability to perceive ourselves as I can do this stuff, right? I was always not by choice. This is kind of the you know the way things are done in Italy, always with more women. So I never felt I have to compete with men. So I, do, I don't want to feel stupid when I ask a question. You know things that happen here all the time. So, and again, since I never experienced them, it took me a long time before I figured out this is a problem here. And once I figure out, then I say, okay, now I have to start doing something. But again, so I still tend to be very naive. And I think it's kind of nice to be naive, right? <laughs> because you, you don't think bad things about other people. You know, again, I'm sure people, everybody's very good intentions. They do bad stuff, but they have good intentions, right? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I really appreciate uh, Professor Colsa bringing that data in when we were doing the research in the archives. Finding the right kind of data to look at was very challenging, and um, the university archives were incredibly gracious with us. Erin George, in particular, did a ton of work with us. But one of the things that the, even the data that we did find that didn't really talk about was culture, which we just sort of talked about now. So when Professor Jeannie and I were talking in advance of this event, she talked about how the importance that culture plays in how women are able to navigate STEM fields. And then when we were going back over email, I have a quote from uh, Professor Colstead's email that said, gender has been a cultural determinant in when where and how women participate in technology. So I'd like to have the next question be a little bit about culture. What has been each of your, what, how would you like to talk about your experience with culture? And I think in particular, culture in higher education. Is there anything unique or different or notable about the culture in higher education and how it has an impact, or if it does, to women's ability to access these positions and opportunities? And Kate, would you start, perhaps? Well, I'm uh, newer to higher education than probably most of you, and so I um, like to say that I sort of backed into it um, from, you know, a, a very long career uh, before I got here. And so um, one of the, so I'm here at a time of a lot of transition. I can feel the transition that's happening because of the work that you're all doing. When I'm in meetings, I, I see it. And I know from my own experience that it probably wasn't always this way. Um, one of the things that I wanted to uh, just spend a couple of minutes talking about is um, they, uh, uh, both, um, I'm sorry, Sally and, and Maria uh, alluded to this, that Bias matters and representation matters um, and mentorship matters. And uh, it's really important that uh, when you have the chance to step into that space that you do that. Um, and I'll share a story about the time when I realized that I was a, um, a role model. I was doing a... a, a video shoot on migrant education and we had traveled to different um, places around the United States to get different footage and I ended up in a third grade class in western Minnesota and uh, with this whole crew, lights and audio and uh, teleprompter, all of the, the whole thing and I was the director. And so we set up all this stuff and we started shooting. And I always would tell people, if you have any questions during the shoot, just let us know. And so we started shooting and we took a break to reset the lights. And the teacher came up with this little girl. Her name was, well, I don't know what her name was. Let's call her Mary. So she, he, uh, she comes up with this little girl in third grade. And um, I said, well, hi, Mary. My name is Kate. And she goes... Are you the boss of these guys? <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm the director and I'm here responsible for the video shoot to make sure that we get a good recording in your classroom. And that totally was not going to answer her question. And she looked at me and she goes, yeah, but are you the boss of these guys? <laughs> and I said, well, 
I suppose if I'm the director <laughs> and I'm here to uh, make sure that we get good footage in your classroom today, that I guess I'm the boss of these guys. Does that answer your question? Do you have anything else? And she goes, no, that's cool. <laughs> and so we finished the shoot. And it was like, you know, we were in there all afternoon and these kids were great and stuff. And as I was walking out, I, you know, we packed up our cases and walked and I, and I turned and I looked at this little girl and she was like, <laughs> like that. And so all of us, all of us never know when we're going to step into that space. And it's really important to do that because what I was, what we were saying before is that technology who runs technology, that's like the keys to the kingdom, right? And so step into the space and grab the keys and do what you're doing and, and be role models and be there for each other. So that's... So you ask a couple of questions and I may come back to those questions. Is it different in higher education than somewhere else? And there's a lot of research actually on women in science and technology in various domains. And it turns out that actually one of the better places to be if you're in science and technology is actually the federal government. And you say, why would that be true? And that's because they have a lot of rules uh, and they have a lot of stepping stones and they really, f you know, sort of in some ways force advancement in some ways because that makes it possible. So sometimes we sit in our own ivory tower here and we think, well, we we talk about everything, we think about everything, we address questions very de deliberately and, and, and elaborate, but, but in point of fact, I think it's very important to have rules and policies uh, and to really have the kind of stepping stones that make it very clear about how you do advancement. And I would think that that's something that, that this WIT group will want to talk about, is just how, how do you, what's the mobility? Because we've, we are still frustrated by the fact that there are so few women at the top, even though there are a lot of women in the ranks. So I would just say, let's not get con overconfident about being academic. As much as I love being an academic myself, uh, I think that there are some real things that we can, can address. So I would make that, that response to you. Um, and I guess I don't quite agree with Maria. I'm, I like to think of myself as an optimist. Uh, but I think there is sometimes very direct and, and, and uh, focused hostility that's there for women. I'm not sure I know the origin of it. I'm not sure that those are necessarily bad people. But I think if culture made you possible to be strong and uh, confident, uh, I think for maybe there are some people for whom that hasn't happened the same way. And the way that they react is to be hostile to someone who wants to be strong. And so I guess I would say it's very very important to address those issues very directly. I think, for example, about what was really keeping women out of, science, out of computer science uh, at the undergraduate level when I came here. And so there was a series of incidents in the Department of Computer Science that Maria may remember. Uh, and there were a group of young men, undergraduate students, and what they did is they, they would put on the computer when we, young women walked into the computer lab, they would put up pictures of nude women. They had in one of the study rooms pictures on the wall. And so we had to be interventionists. We had to say, that's not acceptable. And to be honest, what happened is once the male faculty saw that this was happening, they joined us. I mean, so people mostly do want to do good. And, and what I discovered is I needed to find that middle group of people who all said, that's ridiculous. Uh, that shouldn't be happening. And they intervened. So I would say the other way that we really change culture is that when we see something that's wrong, we intervene. So talking about culture, uh, I think you know, I'm in a good position because I grew up in Italy and then I've been for a long time here. Um, but I learned a lot uh, a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, when I got, took a sabbatical in the Netherlands. I was in Delft, which is a technical university. My host was a woman who's the head of the department. So everything looks fine and good. And then I start talking with her and she tells me, you know, Delft is the worst place in Netherlands for women. The university started the program, tried to get more women. Netherlands is very bad. I say, how come? Netherlands, all those social services, right? You have everything you want. Why women don't go to academia? And so I started again looking at the study they were doing. I started looking, talking to lots of people, and I learned something which had never occurred to me before, which is very strange. So if you look in Europe, you start from Southern Europe, like Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal. There are, uh, uh, and you know, a few other countries there. Turkey, also you can mention that. There are quite reasonable number of women in science. Not a lot, but there are a number. Then you move north, Switzerland, Germany. Germany, very, very few, much fewer. Hmm. 
hmm, how come? Netherlands, again, fewer. And you keep Scandinavia, now we all know all the services, even fewer. So you say, how come? England also, there are very few. So you really try to figure out what's happening. It's kind of cor inverse cor correlation with the weather. The colder it is, the fewer the women are. I say, okay, so first reaction, well, the women are smart, and they, you know, they do different things in warm places. But you know, that's not quite good. But, but the smartness is very interesting things. And I had many people telling me that this could explain. Um, and I learned that when I was invited to Algeria, uh, again, technical university in Algeria, uh, kind of uh, graduate students conference, more than half of them are women. And I was shocked. Wow, what are all doing there? And then I started talking. So this is, I, I, I'm not a historian, so I don't do systematic studies. I just sample, right? So I have a few samples here. So some of them, one of them at least told me, and I thought it was very interesting, say, I know I'm not going to become a computer scientist. I'm not going to get a job in computer science. I'll get married. But I want to show to my husband and I can do it. <laughs> hmm, and that kind of nice, right? Good way of thinking. Then I talk again with people from Turkey, other places. Many of them say, I, I study you know, science or engineering so I can leave my country, right? I can come to the US or other places, right? And, and Iran is another good example for that, right? As you go to, to more rich places, you move up, you know, Germany or so, there is less of this need to leave your country, right? And people, in a sense, are. You, I, I don't want to say life is a little bit easier for women. So you have more choices. You can say, well, if I don't want really to study and work very hard, I can get some other jobs. I don't need to do it. And again, as you move farther and farther north, it's the same thing. You know, Scandinavian countries have a lot of support. And, and you can say, well, why do I have to work very hard and study all this engineering, all this science, every stuff? If I don't like it, I can do something else. So I think there is some truth to this. So understanding culture to me is extremely difficult. I used to generalize much more. And again, now I'm much more careful. Now every time I go to a place, I kind of try to figure out how many women are there? Why are they there? Ask lots of people. Again, I don't know. There must be some historian that has done all the studies. I hope at some point I get a book that tells me all the story. <laughs> I don't have the answers either, but I, but I guess I would also point out that it has to do with economics, because very often it's a question of who's educated and how many. So often in places where not many people are educated and then there gets to be a need for someone who's got technical knowledge, you might as well take women because you need the bodies to do it who are educated. So I think there may be a, a correlation with economics as well as with sort of climate. <laughs> but climate's a fascinating possibility. Samin? Well, like Maria, I think... Um, my background has a lot to do with you know where I am and culture. There's higher higher ed culture and there's actual culture in different countries and how you're brought up. And as I said, I, I think in Iran it wasn't very common for women to get involved in technology. Although um, our system of education is a little different in that from ninth uh, when you finish ninth grade, you actually choose a major. Uh, and the last three years of high school, you study only your major. So you could become, uh, you could choose a major in math, science, or literature, or home ec. And my, uh, my major was science, because my father thought oh, I should study science. He wanted me to be highly educated. And so the, the, the last three years of high school, it's really like the first two years of college here biological sciences, uh, math, uh, physics, chemistry, calculus, and it's concentrated. So every day you, st you study every topic on a daily basis. It's not, you know, like here when high school you choose some fun things and some science classes. There, when you choose a major, your um, education is in your major. So I did have a background in science, and although when I announced to my father I was going to study music at the university, he was really, really disappointed. He wanted me to study medicine. Um, I, I think that that, that uh, background really affected me. My father, my mother also always told me, don't get married until you're in, entirely independent. You've studied enough to be able to work on your own and not depend on your husband, which I thought in those days in Iran was a, a major change in, um, in culture. But anyway, I think all of this affected me, and even though I studied music, I always wanted to do better in my life and not just 
not just play an instrument, which is not a good thing to say, because there's value in, in that as well. But I think culture affected me. I wanted to, to be strong, I wanted to be independent, and I wanted to be involved in technology. So when the opportunity uh, became available for me, I was really excited. But what I, ha what I found out once I got in involved was a big surprise, because I always thought that men in Iran were difficult to deal with when you are in science and technology. And when I traveled to Holland, it was no different. And when I came here, I found out it's, it's pretty much the same. I think women have a really hard time proving that they are intelligent enough, strong enough, capable enough to be a leader, to, uh, to be involved in technology, to any, any field, actually. It doesn't really have to be technology, but to be in the position of leadership. And so it, it takes a lot of effort to, to deal with the uh, culture of the environment you work, with, with, you, know, you work in. At UNIVAC, I was in a military environment. Most of the people were retired military people that they would hire so they could get military contracts. And the people who worked and taught the programming classes were all men with um, um, not higher education background, but they were just trained maybe as military people on board ships to run computers. So it's a, it was a very different environment, and I had a really, really hard time. Although they brought me in, they trained me, and I was working there, it was hard to survive on a daily basis. Uh, I mean, even at lunchtime, you'd get together and these men were all talking about men, men's topics. And you were sort of left in the corner and it was embarrassing to sit there. And, um, and I think that was one of the main reasons I decided to come to the university because I thought an academic environment would be a much nicer environment. And it was. The uh, university was a, a lifesaver for me to, to move from that military environment. But I think in general, no matter where you work, uh, maybe it's different in the last seven years since I left, but there is always ups and downs and it, it's a matter of what group you work in and what type of men you work in and what type of women. And I think if, if there are a lot of strong women in your organization, it's much easier to, to survive in that organization than to be a single woman. And for me, I think culture was uh, a problem because I was a woman, I was an immigrant, and I was small, and which you know is is a negative for for a lot of women. And I had to work hard to prove that I was able to, I was capable of doing what I was supposed to do. So I think culture has many different aspects, and depending on where you are in your life and where you come from in your background, it will affect you differently. But I think ultimately it's who you are individually and how strong and and uh, uh, confident you are in who you are to be able to survive the environment. But uh, it's time to change the environment, I, I think. Uh, and we can see that it's changing. The more highly educated women in science and technology and in all the fields we have, the harder it is for the environment to refuse leadership for women. So I just want to stick on this just for a moment longer because I think one of the, one of the interesting things that I heard was depending on what options are available to anyone, to, to a society, but to women in this case, right? The tolerance to try to change a culture that may or may not be welcoming or favorable, that tolerance goes, is low, could be low because one does have other options. So if, you know, if at the University of Minnesota or, you know, in the United States, I have options for things that I can do that are not in the information technology field where I don't have to overcome some of these challenges and I have other options, why would I not put my energy elsewhere where that's not a particular hurdle that I have to jump over? So I, I guess I'm wondering what's the case for jumping over the hurdle when you have options? And I, I mean, I think there's probably some obvious reasons to that, but why why try to change when you can do something else? I, I would say, if it's really what you want to do, why change? Why go somewhere else because someone is giving you a hard time? This is what I want to do. And I shouldn't be stopped because I'm a woman, I'm from a different culture, whatever the reason is. If you want to do something and if that's what you love to do and what that's what you've hoped to accomplish, the comfort in life is is 
is, should not play a, a role in the decision you make. And I, I think it's important for women to stick with what they want to do and not just say, okay, this isn't going to work. Uh, these guys are making it too difficult for me. I'm going to do something different that I don't really want to do and I'm not really happy with. Um, I, I understand how it is in Europe because it's a different culture and it's a different environment. If a woman wanted to be who she wanted to be in Germany, she can. There's, there's nothing stopping them. So they, they're comfortable with where they are. But I think for most of us, it's sort of a battle. You want to accomplish what you want to accomplish and I, you don't want someone to tell you, no, you can't. And for me, I would fight it tooth and nail. I will not give up. It's an interesting problem, actually, uh, because I think on the one hand, I actually do, I absolutely agree that probably the reason that some of you have survived the things that you have, and in fact, I even think about the fact that as a graduate student, I was one of three women in a graduate program that had 90 men, even in history back in the day. Uh, and I encountered a, cl a class where I had an instructor who wouldn't call on me, wouldn't help me think about my, my research project. I had straight A's in graduate school, except for this fellow who gave me a B plus. Uh, and I had never did figure out quite why I couldn't connect with him. But some part of me got very stubborn about that and said, I'm going to prove you wrong. <laughs> I am going to do this thing. And so I think sometimes if you've got good strength of, of, of character, and, and women's educational institutions have given women that in, very, in many ways historically, because what we know is that if you're in an all-girls school, you're going to be the, the class president. You're going to be the editor of the newspaper. Uh, you're not going to be thinking in terms of competing with men and having that be awkward. And so there's a lot of information about single-sex education and what that had meant for women earlier on. Simultaneously, I do think that that's that some of us here are a generation where we did learn how to cope and we did persist and we kind of stuck it out. And I really am, am eager to see this next generation coming along that says, I'm not going to put up with that. We're going to have mechanisms. We're going to do something about it. We're going to say, we're going to call it what it is and we're going to find what we need is, is, is uh, a peer group. And so what you didn't have was a peer group. Right. But now I'm looking around and I'm saying, there are sufficient numbers of women that you have a peer group so you can talk to them about strategies. And if you you need to, you can take some kind of collective action as well. So I'd like to think that we're now at a next stage where just tolerating it and surviving is not, is not necessarily the only way uh, to bring about cultural change. So one, one reason why I think we should encourage more people to, even if they have choices to do something, even if they don't like it too much, is if you think about computer science, that's what I always tell the girls. What I think. Computer science gives you an amount of power, I mean, the ability to write stuff for computers, right? An amount of power that you cannot have in any other ways, right? Because I don't know how to draw. I am not a mechanical engineer. I don't know how to build stuff. But I can write programs that do whatever I want. And this gives you a lot of power. And this allows you to do a lot of good things for humanities. And typically women, but not only women, you know, we want to do things to help the rest of the world. And I think learning how to use computers, being capable of using computers, uh, gives you, again, power that you would never have it with any other ways. Uh, and, and I, it's an argument that, again, you know, we do summer camps for girls and so, and when they see the richness, when they see the kind of things, they see they can do, you know, video animation, they can do whatever, you know, there are a lot of artistic things that they can do. Then they say, oh, I thought computers is just you sit down every day in front of your terminal in a cubicle, you never speak to the person. Say, no, 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 forget about it, right? So I think there is one pro big problem here, there is a perception. Yes. Of what the field yes. is, uh, that has to be changed. Uh, because once it's changed, uh, a lot of more people are willing to do it. Uh, and, and piece of data I just read very recently, a survey done last year for all, uh, uh, I don't know, 13,000 graduates and undergraduates in computer science across the United States. What's the main career objective that people have? The first one, help others. Which is really interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Think of computer scientists often very introverted. They don't want to speak and so. But still, again, came across the objective number one. So if you are a computer scientist, you can help others. You can do harm, of course. But you can also help others. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to build this kind of things. And say, you know, you have to learn how to use these computers, you know, write your programs, run them, control, whatever. And then you can do a lot of good stuff. 
and I just have to second this, that Maria, Maria Gini does amazing programs, especially in the summers, for girls who might go into computing. So I would underscore the fact that she talks to Girl Scouts, she talks to sixth graders, she talks to everyone, and she's inspiring. So uh, we want to move on to talk a little bit about really specific challenges or milestones, both internally and externally, um, to the university that have been overcome. Um, in listening to talking about culture and thinking about the way that we're positioning the conversation, I was thinking about some of some of my own, you know, particular experiences. And one of the more troubling things that has been said to me on a number of occasions is, I prefer to work with men because they're less emotional. And I will say that the only people who have said that to me are women. So I, I do think there is something there, it, when we talk about culture, it, I think it's really important to, to think about it as everyone. And I'm sure that came right from a place of however they grew up and however they sort of were modeled and mentored to be in in order to be successful, right? To get to your comment about intention, right? And they're not trying to be bad or cruel. They're trying to be honest and to, to model like this is how you can move forward. So what are some of the challenges either individually or milestones um, that have been overcome, where we have seen change, and where we can start to think about where we need to put our, where do we need to put our attention to, to shift change further? Challenges overcome. So I will actually have to say that since coming to the university, I am processing much more than I did. Um, in the other part of my career. Um, and so what does that mean? Um, the uh, institution of higher education is very hierarchical. And um, I came, right, right before I came to the university, I was running my own business where I would say, well, we're going to do it like this. And we did it like this. Well, that doesn't work here. <laughs> um, and so it, um, so I've had to develop um, uh, new skill sets and um, in listening and finding my own voice and uh, figuring out how to be more relational in a way that I hadn't had to rely on before. And um, being in an being in um, this situation has also um, taught me how to connect differently um, with others who are um, in different aspects of the higher edu of higher education because the basic philosophy in higher education is faculty governance. So if you are brought into a role to make change happen, change happens through faculty. And so um, the other aspect that has been, um, uh, it hasn't been a challenge, it's actually been a delight, is to um, begin to work with people um, in a way that, uh, in, in collaboration around an idea and as I've said before, following the energy and not the rules and it's just been, wonderful to see when you are with kindred spirits how things can change in a collaborative way. So um, I don't get to say, well, we're going to just do it this way, and it happens. So um, it's been, that's been a little bit different. It's been actually quite rewarding, too. Uh, I think I, for me, coming into the... Um, position of responsibility, the hard part is really not having a, a cohort that is supportive of you. Um, I think our biggest problem, at least at my generation, was the fact that we were put in positions of responsibility without any training, without any guidance, without an understanding of the environment. And, you know, I, I, I realized this long after I had started working here when I, w uh, I was sent to attend the leadership training. And I went through a year of training with cohorts from other university, the most wonderful experience I've ever had. But I came back and I thought, what if I had this training 25 years ago? How would I have uh, behaved in my position? 
I think absolutely totally differently. It it just opened doors, opened my eyes to different approaches of leading people and allowing, obviously the environment is very different than 30 years ago. And 30 years ago when you were the boss, you told everyone what to do and that was it. And now you understand that everyone around you has something to offer and everyone who works with you and works for you is a leader if you just allow them to lead. And for me, I think the biggest challenge was the fact that um, there was no no guidance, no training. You were thrown in, in the middle of this ring and said, go for it. And you know, having come from a different background, different culture, different education, it was a challenge. And uh, fortunately, at some point, I ended up with a, a wonderful Chinese boss who had great wisdom and was a mentor. And I think that, that that is what that is what we need, especially as young leaders, as young people in a position of responsibility, or just, you know, if you come into technology, whatever position you are, is someone within the organization to mentor you. Uh, someone that you can go to when you're stuck. Sometimes when, uh, when you have a, a situation you want to deal with, there are one or two people you can go to and say, what do I do? How do I deal with this? And I think the loneliness in a position is the worst situation when you're in an environment that's not always... Uh, kind to you, not always supportive of you, um, and not always clear about what the expectations are of you. So I think for women to be successful, and I would say this is for men too, but I think for women specifically, is an environment that is supportive, environment that provides opportunity for you to learn from others and provides you with a, a mentor and someone who can guide you through the process. I, for women these days, the challenges are much bigger and it's important to have someone else that you can go to and you can share experiences and get uh, get advice. So I'll just tag on to that very quickly to say when I came in as an associate dean into what was then IT actually before it became CSE, uh, College of Science and Engineering, I came in as an associate dean uh, and I came into an environment where there had been a lot of problems. And so there was a lot of questioning about who I was, what I was going to do, how I was going to try and do that. And and the, co the complication of even the women who were already here, those 19 women, there were some women who had really had horrific experiences and they were angry and they were bitter and there were young women who were coming in who'd had very few of those kinds of experiences and they were young and they were eager and they didn't want to talk about the fact that there might be a hostile environment. So I had a retreat and really it was almost, <laughs> it was a very, very difficult kind of conversation and it persisted like that for a while. And so I had to figure out how to navigate that, which went a, a woman cohort I was working with that wasn't necessarily coherent and on the same page. I also had to deal with a lot of departments and, and men who thought, what is she being paid to do and why do we need her here in the first place. So I had, you know, a number of things that were kind of, excuse me, were kind of challenging me. Uh, but then I found a group of other women who were administrators around the university, and we got together once a month, and we had a dinner at someone's house, and we could talk to each other, and we had kind of the sense of anything I say here will stay here. And that group really helped me through those first two years. So I think what you sometimes have to do is get completely out of the place you're in. Find another group of people who can understand and, and maybe talk to you about what's going on, and then have that cohort. So mentors are important. But so are getting out of your environment and finding other people who can help you without having all the baggage that comes from being in that particular place. So I guess I would say, yes, look for help. <laughs> So, I mean, I think the fact that there's much more awareness of the problems is good, right? People now talk about the women, why they're not enough women, why do we need more women? Uh, and many years ago, this didn't even happen. So I think it's been progress, because at least uh, it's rare to find somebody say, oh, really? There is a women problem in science? Everybody knows, right? And to me, again, it's a positive, it's a positive step. Uh, the fact also there are a few more women. I mean, I was kind of looking like, uh, you know, computer science undergraduates, the numbers are abysmal. Uh, we used to have like 9% women in the major uh, six or seven years ago. Now we got to 15%. I mean, it's not a lot, but now because we have more majors, now we have 104 women in our major, in, in the Bachelor of Science, CBS. And we used to be like, we were smaller, right? So the fact also computer science is growing because that's where the money is, that's where the jobs are. So some people are coming in. So we have more women. And even though the, the ratio is still 
not favorable, but if I have, you know, 100 women in the program, they can do a lot of different things as opposed to have only 20 because the program is small and there are very few. So again, there is power in numbers and we all know that, again, we need to have enough numbers in, every, in any community. Now, instead of being the only girl in a class of 40 students, maybe there are two or three, you know, not very good, but two or three is much better than one. Right, so I, I'm I'm optimistic. Again, <laughs> I always say, you know, there is progress, but the progress is very slow, yeah. uh, and the issue is what can we do to accelerate the project? Because you know, if we continue this space, you know, we take another ten years before we get to maybe the thirty percent, which is kind of the magic number, and that's I don't think is acceptable. So. That is a wonderful segue to our next question. And also, you did a, an excellent job of plugging why WIT is an opportunity, right, for people to connect. Um, so Sarah Allen, a computer programmer and founder of Blaze Cloud, which is a mobile app company, said, if you're interviewing people for your job and you haven't interviewed a woman, don't hire until you've interviewed at least one woman. And if your recruiter can't get you resumes that are diverse, find another recruiter. Um, in addition to this advice, um, or maybe even reflecting on that advice, what can we do, even if we are not in hiring authority positions, what can we do to more effectively recruit women into technology fields? Where should we be looking and how can we set women and girls up for success so they can see themselves as having a place in this field? Because everybody, again, regardless of their position here, can do something about that. What should we do? Well, the first thing that I think has to happen is that little girls need to see women um, taking up space and um, being present and being involved in technology and being excited about technology. And, um, and they see that, you know, uh, when we're with them, but they also need to see it um, there's what what I wanted to say is there's this wonderful person at McAllister, wonderful woman at McAllister. She was featured in Variety today. Her name is Duchess Harris, and she's putting together some children's books. And we so representation is what I had said earlier. That's so important. Uh, girls need to see other women, um, uh, and in history. You know, being represented, and and we need to be on boards. Um, the the bo uh, women represented on boards is like there's only like 16 percent of boards that have women on it. So, from early on in their lives all the way through when we're adults, we need to take up space. And the way that we do that sometimes is to take up space for other women. So women supporting women in meetings. If, if a woman in, you know, in a male-dominated meeting um, says something, uh, I, I really appreciate it when I see another woman say, that was very interesting. Can you say more about that? That makes a difference. That makes a difference because it's modeling. It's modeling something different, that we all have a right to take up space. So... Um, I, I just think it's really important for uh, women to support women um, from early on all the way through uh, when, when it's time for them to take leadership roles, and we do that with each other. I'll just tag on and say I absolutely agree because I had thought about this question. We had some of these questions somewhat in advance. And so it's this question of affirming other women who are who are achieving. So from the standpoint of young women and girls saying, oh, you like to do this when they're coming to the summer program and you can do robotics too, uh, all the way through to our peers. And I think we don't do enough. Uh, probably for men and for women, to really look around at, at the people who we are working with and saying, that's really a good job. I think I ought to nominate you for this award. And we don't see women getting awards, I think, proportionately the way that they should, and we don't see people in the ranks getting awards the, the proportionate that they should. So there's the President's uh, Award for Outstanding Leadership. And that doesn't go to enough of people who are in the ranks. Faculty maybe disproportionately get those awards because they're, they, they promote themselves very successfully. We know how to 
use our resumes really well. Uh, and so what you really be, what we should really be doing is, is affirming the women who are being successful in IT, and that will, in fact, I think, make them more visible. The other thought that I had is that you may not be in the position of doing the hiring, but you probably are often on the search committees as women are coming through. And I just was on a search committee, me, at a search committee meeting the other day. As, as I read the letters of recommendation for women and for men, the, the sort of stereotypes of women are still there. Mm -hmm. She's very pleasant. She is a good hard worker. Uh, and for the men, it's, he's very creative and he's very, he's exceptional in many ways. And so there was even in one letter and that said, one letter that said, um, she's very good. Uh, she has a lot of promise, but someone needs to talk to her about being more focused on her research in a letter of recommendation. And one of my colleagues said, he, he quoted it because he said, I don't think she's right for us because of that. And I had to stand up and say, just a minute, have you read that ever in a letter? for anybody else, particularly for a man, but I just said for anybody else, I said, there's something strange about that. Let's look at the rest of the letters and let's look at, at her credentials because I think there is still something in the way that we need to screen all the time for where we see bias and intervene if that bias is there. So that's um, my other point. Was that a man who had written that letter of recommendation? It was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think I think sometimes even I've even seen it for women though there's yeah. a sense to say you'll really like her. Yeah, of I, course you should like her, yeah. <laughs> and him too. I, I think I go back to when I was at the university. I attended Educause a few years ago, and one of the sessions we talked about um, girls and their relationship to math and sciences. And the person who had done the research said that in most situations. By third, uh, by third grade, most girls have decided that math isn't for them. So it happens really early on in, in women's lives where they either they don't have good teachers, they don't have good mentors, parents don't encourage it, I don't know the environment, but by third grade, we've lost the girls. If they are not interested in math and sciences by then, they basically don't want to be involved. And um, when I was at the university, I had one of my wonderful employees do a class for a high school after hours um, in simple programming, just doing simple uh, programming. And we went to the class, and the class is all boys. And I'm thinking, my intent was really just to have girls come to this class. What is going on? And, and I talked to the principal, and I talked to a lot of the teachers, and they said, girls think it's too nerdy to attend the class. Boys will not pay any attention to them if they are in technology, if they attend the computer class. And I think that the, the problem is right there. We are brought up to think that, you know, at third grade level, our girls are deciding, I don't want to be involved because it's, you know, I'll, I'll be nerdy, or I, I'm just not made for math and sciences. Everybody can do it. It's just really having the right environment, having the right encouragement. When I was teaching at UNIVAC, I, I taught a class about the history of computers and mostly things that were related to UNIVAC. So we were talking about ENIAC, one of the early computers. And what I found out was the people who actually were involved in most of the software development were six women. This is in 1944. Yep. And in 1946, when the machine went public, when they announced it to everyone, even though the women had done all the work, there was no mention of any of the women. The men took credit for everything that had happened to this computer, even though they were the hardware people. And women had done all the software, all the language development, everything. These six women were not given any credit. And when there was an event afterwards, <laughs> and they had, a, they had a celebration afterwards, the women were not invited. So do we think that we have come very far from there? I don't know. I mean, I'm not directly involved anymore in the area, but I, I do think that we don't have an environment that's encouraging women. And women who are in technology, women who are in positions of power, should really take that opportunity to give some of their time to schools, to um, areas, you know, environments uh, where young girls go to for after school activities or community centers and things like that. And we need to uh, begin a system where we can encourage women to get involved and not feel like it's not for me, it's too nerdy, it's, you know, they're not going to respect me or it's going to be really hard for me to get involved in technology. Everybody can do it. 
and our environment should be encouraging. But unless we put time and effort in developing the young women today to get to that point, I think it's going to be really hard for the future to have a lot of women in technology. And one other thing that we did when we were hiring, I have to mention this, my boss actually called HR and said, I don't want you to review applications for me. Send me all the applications. Because they were just looking at a list of things. And in technology, it's really hard because the people who are reviewing don't really know technology. And so they would just say, OK, does it meet A, B, C, and D? No, out. And so at some point, my boss called them and said, send me every application, which was a lot of work for us, because we had to review 30 applications instead of five. But we found some wonderful people. And I think it's important to get to the point of you know, have, giving the opportunity for the person who has applied to uh, get their foot in the door. I want to add to what Sally was saying. I mean, let's talk about us as opposed to the younger generation, which is very important. I mean, you say we need to promote each other for awards, for advancement, for positions. And there is some evidence that women often are nastier to other women that they are to men. I agree. Again, I don't know why, but there is enough evidence. And so we have to make sure ourselves overcome that and say, is there any opportunity I can recommend my friend, a worker, work with me for advancement, for awards, for recognition? There is like in the, I'm in artificial intelligence, and artificial intelligence within computer science used to have a good percentage of women, more than other areas. Things have changed a lot. Now it's, they're much smaller. So now there is kind of a group of people trying to make sure every time a nomination of a IIII fellow, which is again a fellow of the society, there are enough women nominated. Every year, some years there is zero women nominated. And so that is a group of women trying to dig out and say, who can we nominate? for the all different awards. I think it's something every, every one of us can do, because we all know about different opportunities and so. And if we start that with help, number two, I think we learned male allies. Let's try to make sure, don't, don't consider the men the bad people. We always have to find an ally. And often men are willing, very supportive. Mm -hmm. So again, if I want to nominate somebody for promotion and so, maybe I go again to the boss or whatever. I know it's favorable. It's going to look. Again, we cannot do ourselves everything. Find the right people to be allied with. And they can be men. No problem. No discrimination, right? Mm -hmm. We don't make any discrimination. We want to do things good for everyone. I'll just point out that indeed every one of us has talked about somebody who helped us along the way who was not female. So I think indeed you need to have mentors across the board. I do want to make one comment about the, the question of young women because again, it's all of us have to do something. Uh, when I first came, there's a program here, some of you know it, it's called Umpty Ump, right? Yes. It's for advanced mathematics uh, for children in the school system. And when I came, the man who was in charge came to me and he said, you know, I'm having a hard time getting enough girls for this after school program. And so w what we did is we worked out a strategy. So I said, well, maybe it's the teachers. So he went and talked to the teachers who were teaching middle school math and said, can I see your, your lists of students? And very often there would be quite a few girls who would be as, as talented, doing as well in the classes as some of the men were. And so he said to the teacher, well, are you, are you asking these young women whether they want to be part of the Umpty Ump program? And sometimes they said yes, sometimes they said no, and so he was encouraging them to do it, and he got a few more, a few more girls. But it still wasn't coming up very much, so he went back to the, to the teachers and said, well, what's happening? They're not still coming. And the teacher said, well, you better talk to the counselors, the grade counselors, because some of them are saying, when these young women came in, uh, why do you want to go into that after-school program? What do you think you want to be? And they didn't know that they wanted to be something that needed mathematics, and so they they'd say, well, maybe I don't need mathematics, or maybe I don't want mathematics. So then he started working on the high school counselors. Got more young women, but he said they're still not coming. The next thing he found out was from the counselors that even if they recommended it, sometimes the parents would be mm -hmm. unclear about why their daughter should do more mathematics. And so I think it's Everyone has to be encouraged to think about why should girls do mathematics? Because we all know that mathematics is the gateway. If you're going to do engineering, if you're going to do science, if you're going to do computer science, you better have that math background. And so it really behooves all of us as we're talking to the little girls in our lives to really say, oh, that's great, and play mathematics games with them and really encourage them to think about it so that they see the possibilities, the possibilities you were talking about. You can make lives better, you can have a really big adventure, and you'll make a lot of money. All of those things are good. <laughs> well, that's 
end it on that positive note. <laughs> so um, I want to transition into our Q&A period. I also uh, received this, which is a really great plug because we're talking about resources and things we can do. Um, for those of you that know Jill and Jason Wojak, they have a 501c3 called Code Kitty. You can go to codekitty.org, which is an effort to teach coding to young girls grades three through five. There's also Black Girls Who Code, which I don't know that it has a actual group here in the Twin Cities, but that's a national organization as well. So I'd like to open it up, like I said, for questions, and I can't run the mic around, so if you have a question, raise your hand, say it, and then I'll repeat it for the benefit of our online audience. Yes, Laura. watching women that I wish I'd seen a long time ago. Excuse me, I'm a little emotional. <laughs> yes. So, um, so we talked a little bit during this about the challenges that you have experienced throughout your career and that you've seen other women experience. I'm wondering, what was your most strong moment where you stood the tallest and felt, yes, grounded, I really do belong here? So the question is, what is one of your, what is your strong moment where you felt you were standing tall in your role? I kind of, I don't know, again, I'm sort of naive. I thought I was good at doing computer science. I don't care if other people don't appreciate me. I still do because I love it. So I never had this moment in which I say, I belong here. I always think I belong to whatever I want to be. I don't know that I ever had a moment either, uh, but I think there certainly have been moments where I've either been affirmed by other people or when something that I've that I've done. I mean, academics write books, and so you know when I wrote a book and it was on women, gender, and science, and I got positive responses, and that meant somebody was reading it. <laughs> that was a pretty good moment. So I wasn't sure if I was going to talk about this, but I think it's important to, because I know this is true for many people in the room. Um, so as I said, when I was in television, I was like a very young person in a very male-dominated field. And um, these men became my allies. And they became actually my protectors. I was, uh, I don't want to get into the details, but I, you know, I left television for a reason. And um, uh, I was sharing this with Ingrid that it, it's so wonderful to be at a point in my career to look back and know that I am living through the amazing social movements that we're all a part of now that wouldn't happen without allies. Sometimes you need allies, sometimes you are allies. And uh, and you just don't know when that's going to be. And um, uh, my allies were these men that were like so much older than me who told this guy that if you ever do that again, I'll break your legs. And it's like I felt like I was working with the mafia or something. <laughs> instead of, But um, it, it was just knowing that people had my back and told me that they, that they really respected me and cared for me um, was, it, it, it's like being kind and being good. And uh, I'm... Again, I look out at all of you, and I know that you all experience struggles, and sometimes you feel like imposters, and you're not quite sure why you're not being taken seriously, and that's when we step into the space with you and say, can you say that again? So um, nice. s speak up again. So just keep speaking. Technology is really, I, 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 like I said before, it is the keys to the kingdom. So the more that we can get girls involved in technology early on, the more that um, they will have wonderful careers too and can have the keys. Sometimes I think that women uh, sometimes don't know how to support women because it's a scarcity issue. It doesn't feel like the table's big enough. So we just have to make the table bigger. 
Well, for me, I think um, with all the challenges in the 30-some years I was here, there were a lot of moments that I felt really, really strong. I, I think having been here during the period where technology went from nothing to mm -hmm. where we are today, you can imagine there are so many times when we had major achievements, and as a group, we all felt strong, right? Yeah, I, there are a lot of people from uh, OIT here. Um, and I think the achievements uh, are what make you feel fantastic, you know? Um, having been involved with a group of absolutely, how, I, I have to say that the environment I worked, I worked in was filled with people who were extremely smart, extremely intelligent, well-read, well-rounded, you know, people who were in, interested in art, music, theater. It wasn't just technology, and it was just wonderful to be in that organization. And together, we achieved a lot. And the, the 30 years was just a fantastic time. I'm, I'm really proud that I've that I was part of that that organization during this period of time. As I said, there were challenges, but I think there were a lot of really fantastic times during the time I was here. Yes. Oh, did you have a question? No, sorry. Other questions? Yes. Actually, on the more negative side of the spectrum, was there ever like a moment or multiple moments where you, you felt like you didn't believe in yourself and there was like a specific person you turned to, a group, group you turned to to sort of combat that? So the question is a time where you doubted your own abilities and who did you turn to? Well, I can only remember one period. Uh, I think Bernie was here then. Um, at some point after we had achieved great achievements, we had introduced Internet Gopher, which was the very beginning of access to the Internet for the average person. Um, a year or so after that, the university decided to just fire us all. <laughs> And <laughs> so it was, it was a hard time. I understand there were reasons for doing what they were doing. It was starting a new organization and rehiring us all into a new position. But it was devastating for the organization. And I think that's probably the lowest time that I remember in, in the time that I was at the university. And again, as a group, we managed to overcome it. And we convinced the university it was the wrong decision. And they backed down. But the effect was, was deep and painful. Uh, so, you know, there are some really wonderful times, but there are some not so very good times. It's just a matter of being strong, staying together. And if you are, as a group, strong and stay together, you can, you can achieve a lot more than, you know, uh, being against each other and uh, not working together. So it, it's not the end of the world. Bad things happen in every job, and you just have to be strong enough to move on. So you asked if there was ever a time that you didn't feel, what was the question again? Like you didn't believe in yourself just to be in the environment. You, that you didn't believe in yourself and that you didn't belong. I think everybody in this room has had that. Um, and I had that feeling. And sometimes it can go on for days. Um, that's what they call the imposter syndrome. And I think it's really important um, to turn to your friends. I've got friends in this room right now and allies. Um, and, and listen to each other. It's about listening. It's about finding kindred spirits um, and following the energy, not the rules. Um, and uh, because you're paying it forward because you are going to be that person. You're going to be sitting here someday, and some younger person is going to ask you, well, what did you, what did, how did you get through that? You're going to get, you know, we all have these times uh, that we feel like imposters, and um, you just lean on people, and they, they help you, and it's really, that's, part of pulling people up from when they're at where they're at because that happened for you someone pulled me up so thanks for asking the question so as an academic this happens all the time so, right <laughs> because you know at the end of the day we do research we write papers we try to get them published uh, write proposals 
try to get funded. Most of the time they are rejected, right? Mm -hmm. Proposals, you know, NSF, I don't know, 15% acceptance. So you have to write tons of stuff before some money shows up. Papers, the same thing. I mean, so you, so you feel this there must be something I've done wrong, right? All the times, because otherwise I would get funding, I would get my papers accepted, everybody loves my work. So on the technical side, yes, this happens all the times. But at the same time, I think it's normal. I mean, right? I mean, who? Maybe there are a few geniuses in the world. Mm. They have everything that they do always making it through. This happens to everybody. And, and what helped me a lot is when I started discovering lots of other people, famous people, tell you, oh, this my paper was rejected four times, four conferences, and then was accepted. I say, oh, this happened to me, and I thought I was so stupid, right? So when you know what happens to other people, and we don't talk in general about rejections, right? Because we talk, oh, my book was published, my paper was published, you say, oh, my proposal was rejected. But it happens to everybody. So this, this happens, and you just have to know I'm not the only one, and so that to me is the only defense, right? I think everyone in this room is someone who works hard and is probably a pretty high achiever in some way. And so the reality is if you're going to have aspirations, you're going to have failures. And so part of it is just understanding that that is going to happen. And who wants to be the person that just mumbles along and doesn't take any chances? Take the risks. Understand failure is going to come. But carry on because we all have gotten there. And, and you're absolutely right. The day I walk out of my classroom and I think they didn't follow me today. I mean, I, I go home a lot at night and say, could I have done better? Why isn't it better? Uh, whether it's the publications, whether it's the teaching, whether it's chairing a committee, uh, it's all challenging. And some days I feel better about it than not. But I know that I have to look back and say, I did the best I could. <laughs> and that's, that if, keeps you going. Yeah, if you're feeling low, I think it's also important that mentorship is, is really important if you don't have confidence in yourself at some point, which we all have had. Yeah. I failed at this thing, I failed, this wasn't, you know, I would go home sometimes and I couldn't sleep until the next morning because I thought I had failed at something. Uh, but tomorrow is another day, and as, as long as you have confidence in yourself and you have someone around you that you can talk about it, it's part of life. It's not just job, it's in every aspect of your life. There are moments that you're low and you don't feel confident, but you can get over it. You just have to work at it. That is a perfect place to, I think, end this part of our time together. Can you please give a hand for our panelists? So I mentioned this at the beginning, up on the screen is the Z-Link for the Google form where you can add your story. So hopefully you were inspired by what you heard today to do that. Um, that is gonna be really important, again, to kind of filling the gaps in the history that we have. If you can't join us in the Upson room now, there are hard copies. They look like this over on the table by the fabulous KT. This It's gonna be challenging for you to read, but it's just to give you a sense of what you will see. These are the pan one of the two panels that we're working on that will be on display at the second floor of Wall library. When those are ready, we will coordinate one of our co monthly coffees and we will take a tour. So networking, getting people engaged, bring a friend, come to those, co to those coffees. Yes, KT? Oh, yes. I'm, and we will, put, we will have them online and available for people to look at as well. So with that, we are adjourned and please join us in the Upson room. Thanks, everybody.